in theory, we should be live. Yay! But as always, we need somebody to tell us. And then also, you know, people are going to want to tell us about the audio levels. So let us know what the audio levels are. Come on over. Oh, yeah. Using some other tool. You're always so good at this, promoting these live chats in some other so mechanism. I... I have freedom running um, during work hours, so like it just shut off and let me back on Twitter because I oh, really? can't allow myself. Oh. I've had to because my job no longer requires me to be on social media. It, yeah, it can be and so now you realize that it was no longer your job and it was just your addiction. Yep, and I had to <laughs> I had to turn off Facebook and Twitter, and like I have a program that helps me by turning it off. Yeah, I'm that person. <laughs> All right, you could be a little louder, or I could be a little quieter. No, wait. You wait could a be second. A, no, wait, no, wait a second. Wait you're, a second. No, you're the noisy astronomer. All right. I uh, we're alive and level. My name a little bit. Yeah. Okay, right. no, Nicole could be up a little bit. Okay, let's do that. Let's just put her up a little right. bit. Wee. Sorry. Uh, what? Awesome. Happening? All right. So let me know. As always, feel free to let me know if the audio levels, because I have no way to know. What the what the actual <laughs> final output is? Uh, oh man, why do people gotta be jerks already? Uh, hey everyone, so uh, of course I'm Fraser. Uh, this is our Monday live chat, and I've brought a good friend of mine, Dr. Nicole Gallucci, who is also known as Noisy Astronomer. She's a radio astronomer, PhD. Uh, which is with the the picture, and I picked of all the pictures I could have picked of you. I loved the one of you out at the very large array listening. What is clearly just a pair of audio headphones that has you just like stage uh, yeah. the picture, right? We totally staged it. Yeah. yeah. So many of you. So this is so I uh, I teach college now, and when I ask my undergraduate classes who has seen Contact, maybe one hand goes up, maybe usually none. However, I feel like this audience is probably a little joke. bit more into their space movies. Yeah, so this is, uh, the picture itself is from 2004 when I was a, an undergrad and a summer student. And we were at the Very Large Array. So I was an hour to the east in Socorro, New Mexico, where the array is run, doing yep. my summer research. Uh, but they brought us out to the array to give us the cool behind the scenes tour. And then we actually had to give our own tours later in the summer. So of course, uh, every one of us, uh, at least the, many of the women in the group, wanted to relive their, you know, Ellie Arroway fantasy and do the the headphone. Um, so yes. So even though yeah. I am known for railing against yes. you <laughs> the idea of also, listening to radio telescopes, I am a hundred percent guilty yeah. of uh, of doing that. Of perpetuating so, yeah. the stereotype. But you know what? Okay, so like legit, that movie is a big reason why I wanted to become an astronomer because I yep. saw an astronomer on screen. Yeah, she's fictional, but you know, that, that had a uh, quite an impact on me. Yeah, my so, daughter but... loved the movie still. Uh, no, I, I had a big impact on me. The book, you yeah. know, the original book had a big mm -hmm. impact on me. So no, I understand that. I get it. Um, yep, yep. So why don't you tell people who you are and what you do? Sure, so sure. They, so, so they can know what kinds of questions <laughs> they're going to be asking. Sure. So uh, I am an astronomer by training. Um, I got my uh, PhD at University of Virginia and uh, working with the National Radio Astronomy Observatory. Um, I did so as an undergrad, I did some stuff with uh, not the VLA, actually, but the very long baseline array, which are these 10 identical as identical as you can get radio telescopes spread throughout North America that is used as one uh, great telescope, radio telescope. Uh, and so I did some work looking at uh, supermassive black holes in galaxies with that, particularly um, really tiny ones, really small ones that appeared to be young uh, or, or episodic, meaning they had, you know, were turning on and off in, in their uh, giving off blobs of gas that gave off radio waves. Um, and in graduate school, I actually I did instrumentation. So I was building radio telescopes, um, particularly this funky little array called PAPER. Um, yep. It's the precursor to a project that's running now called the uh, Hydrogen Epic of Reionization Array, HERA, mm -hmm. um, which is still being run by a lot of my collaborators from that PAPER project. Um, and then I kind of shifted gears into education research a bit for um, 
my postdoc where I worked with uh, Pamela Gay and CosmoQuest. I did a lot of the outreach um, for CosmoQuest uh, and actually still finishing a paper <laughs> from that right you can, now. This you can summer. never leave. You can never leave. Yeah, I can't no. run away. I can't. can't. No. Um, yeah, uh, so CosmoQuest is citizen science. So you join in uh, to do the research. Um, and so I actually studied the motivations of citizen scientists. Um, by interviewing a whole bunch of you lovely folks, and uh, I don't, <laughs> I don't remember who anyone is because you've all been coded as numbers so that it's kept completely anonymous. But you are all still awesome. Uh, you know, one five three eight nine, go with you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be publishing that. Well, yeah, uh, Georgia Bracy and I are frantically typing away at that. Um, I now teach physics and astronomy at a small liberal arts college called Saint Anselm College in New Hampshire. Um, don't have a radio astronomy class yet, um, but we're, th I'm their first astronomer, so I'm kind of slowly building, uh, the astronomy class offerings as I go. Um, so I teach, uh, I teach our physics majors. We have a lot of engineering physics majors mm -hmm. as well. So I've gotten to teach some fun engineering classes, which I never even took as an undergrad, <laughs> um, teaching astronomy. Uh, I also teach elementary education majors so our future school teachers i teach them their science uh and i just uh started a, a national science foundation um a, a funded program at our school to get more science majors uh interested in teaching by having them work in after school program um with uh students from manchester new hampshire uh, particularly uh, immigrants and refugee uh, right. and other underrepresented students. Um, so we're going to be teaching them lots of science and hopefully getting more scientists through education. And I'm also like trying to set up a research computer because I have this like other radio astronomy data just sitting <laughs> that I'm like, ah, student projects. So I'm trying to do all the things. It's uh, fun. <laughs> so, oh man, a question came up. Uh, this comes mm -hmm. from Arjone. Have you ever been to the National Quiet Zone? What is that and where is it? Yeah, so the national the national uh, radio quiet zone is a little rectangle. Uh, it covers part of West Virginia and Virginia, um, where radio emissions are regulated because that's the site of uh, one of the first major radio observatories in the United States, Green Bank, uh, the Green Bank Observatory used to be part of the National Radio Astronomy Observatory. It split off. I can't remember if that was like a year or two now. Um, because of reasons that involve funding and things. Um, but it's a really great observatory, and that's where we built the prototype of the array I worked on at grad school paper. Um, we built the prototypes out there, we tested them out there, we tested the ever-loving heck out of them before going into the middle of nowhere, the Karoo in South Africa, to deploy the actual right. uh, final instrument. How's the cell phone uh, so reception out there? I spent a there. lot of time. Completely non-existent. Yeah. My phone, you know, I had you know, my it's phone back then. Yeah. Like, like for years after grad school, I still carried an Ethernet cable with me, even though Wi-Fi is everywhere, because I spent so much time in Green Bank where there's no Wi-Fi, right. <laughs> and you had to plug. And like for years, I would carry an Ethernet cable with me. I think I finally stopped, stopped like two years ago. <laughs> so let's talk about the square kilometer array then. So for people yeah. who aren't familiar with this this observatory or this collection of observatories, what is it? So the Square Kilometer Array uh, is a project to build out a literal square kilometer of collecting area. Now, the collecting area of a radio telescope is not exactly the geometric area of the dish or the dive hole or whatever you have, but it's related to that. Um, and so this is a really ambitious project to, to make a huge, a lot of collecting area and over a wide range of frequencies. Um, so this project uh, is something that I've I've watched from when I was a student, when it was still in the, we have no idea how we're gonna build this thing, yeah. <laughs> um, to something now, as you say, two observatories, um, for various reasons, uh, they are building one of the arrays in South Africa. So actually in the Karoo, uh, the location where we built our array, we were one of the Pathfinder projects for that site, and one in Australia. And the reason you go to these sites because uh, the radio, National Radio Quiet Zone, as we mentioned, they can regulate um, radio emissions. But even with that, uh, a really sensitive telescope is still going to pick up a lot of stuff um, from just nearby human civilization. Um, so these are two locations that are really radio quiet. 
Uh, again, we're using sound metaphors, but I promise you we're talking about light, radio light. Yeah. Um, and uh, so the, the plan is to go a lot deeper and be uh, more sensitive to be able to map out, um, I haven't looked at the science cases in a while, but uh, I know that they were looking to map out the neutral hydrogen in galaxies out to some ridiculously large distance. I can't remember right now. Yeah, so part, you know, one fun thing I got to do in grad school was go out to South Africa and spend like two and a half weeks out in the Karoo, uh, where there's nothing. I mean, yeah. talk about your cell phone being a brick. There was no point <laughs> in getting an international plan because right. you weren't gonna be anywhere near a cell phone. Yeah. Yeah. But, the yeah. Oh, I was just gonna say, but I mean, those two. I mean, the trick in in putting those two telescopes you know, one in Australia and one in South Africa is they can act like mm -hmm. a single telescope, right? And radio waves, um, I mean, radio waves are kind of special right. about this. And this is, you know, I'm going to ask yeah. if you've got a super secret advanced picture of the event horizon from the event horizon telescope at some point. <laughs> I, sadly, I don't. I wish I yeah. did. Um, I don't last. Uh, I remember the SK is they were building the two, the two different arrays. We're going to look at two different frequencies. Okay. So okay. you really don't have a same. You know, reason to combine them, but you could. Right. Um, as you separate those individual elements of your array, you get finer and finer resolution, meaning you can see smaller details. And that's what they're doing with the Event Horizon Telescope. They're using uh, not exactly the same, but similar telescopes. I'm trying to remember, I, know, I feel like one is in Chile, one's in... Well, one I mean, they used... The Mauna Kea Telescope. They used all of them, right? And they used one in space. They even used radio telescopes in space to yeah. sort of put together yeah. one gigantic yeah. image. One, they even used data from Australia and yeah. one of the reasons why the data took so long to come back was because they had to wait for the Antarctic summer to arrive so they could actually get the data out of there, right? Oh they had to gosh. fly it out. They had to fly out terabytes okay. of hard drives mm -hmm. off of mm -hmm. uh, Antarctica to be able to, to do the integration. And they're doing the, they're apparently working on the integration right now. And I've now heard like spring 2019, which is like a year longer than I kind of had demanded. So... <laughs> demanded yeah. okay i i got you because i was i was working at haystack in 2003 again as an undergrad uh when they were first doing this stuff and so yeah i've been waiting since 2003 yeah <laughs> and, you know it's we, really hard paul and paul it's and i really talked about this last week right well i guess that's but but it is even possible right uh, to mm -hmm. combine the image after the fact from multiple telescopes mm -hmm. into yep. one higher resolution. So can you explain just a little bit about how interferometry works so that people, sure. and especially from the radio perspective? Sure. So interferometry uh, uses multiple telescopes. So the, the simplest explanation is that um, you have multiple telescopes connected to make one big telescope, right? Because Making one large dish is not super easy. We have our SIBO as an example of one, and FAST is another example. But if you want one the size of the planet, guess what? Our engineers have not figured out how to do that. Right. Um, but you can connect these telescopes and make it act like one telescope. That's the really simple explanation. Um, when I was learning this, they take you right from that to here's a whole bunch of set of Fourier transforms. Like there was nothing in the middle. There's a whole lot of math on how it works. Right. But, but there's actually ways of thinking about okay. it in, in between that. Yeah. Oh, don't worry. I'm not going to leave. Okay. That. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the way I the way I like to picture it, instead of thinking of each one of these telescopes, they all combine to make one. So let's use the VLA as an example because that one is small, small-ish. I mean, it's in one location. You can picture it, right? 27 little dishes sticking out in the desert, uh, acting like one telescope. What you can do is treat, instead of treating each disc as a telescope, treat each pair of dishes as a telescope. So you've got, you know, this pair, you've got this pair, you've got this pair, uh, and each pair sees the sky in a slightly different way. Now, if you're familiar with um, the way waves behave, so I'm going back to, kind of think back to, Interphysics, when you talk about interferometry, uh, you could talk about this in terms of a double slit experiment. You have light shining through two slits. They interfere and make this, um, I guess, this white, gray, black, you know, stripey pattern because of the way that waves interfere. Um, so instead of giving off light through two slits, it's, it's accepting light through two slits. So it works backwards and it sees 
instead of seeing the sky the way your eyeball sees the sky, it's seeing the spatial distribution of light in the sky. It's kind of a weird way of thinking of it. I have I have diagrams somewhere that do a slightly <laughs> better job. It's, yeah. it's still tough. But you can think of each pair of telescopes, if they're close together, they tend to see larger distribution of light. If they're far away from each other, they tend to see finer detail. And you can take the data from all of these pairs of telescopes. So it's instead of 27, it's 27 times 26, whatever that is. I can't, I can't do numbers in my head. I'm so sorry. Uh, that's how many telescopes you have and you're adding all that information together and putting that together to get your picture. Okay. And yeah. <laughs> one, one second here. But like when I think about like when you think about, let's like, say, two like visible light telescopes, right? And you just take two visible light mm -hmm. telescopes, you put them side by side, say a binocular, the large binocular mm -hmm. telescope, things like that. It's not like you're just adding up the m mirror surface area of those two telescopes. Right. You get the separation of those telescopes as your, as the power of the telescope, as the the resolution. Of right, the the separation determines the resolution. You can do this with optical telescopes. No, too. I know, and so and yeah. that's where it kind of and and I guess that's the key is that it's that interference, right? It's yeah. it's the way yes. the radio signals because you're seeing those two from those two different perspectives. You're letting the photons interfere, and that's how you're building yeah. up that larger picture. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, so the, the, the reason I've, I've, I've searched for this explanation is goes back to that picture that you showed of me on the, you know, with the headphones. Yeah. Um, so 2004, I was giving tours of the VLA while still learning how interferometry works. And, uh, the student I, I forget who I was paired up with at the time, um, we were asked by one of the visitors, like, wait a second, you said this image has thousands of pixels but you only have 27 antennas out there. How do you get, you have 27 points. How do you get thousands of pixels? And we went, uh, and we tried to explain what we knew and failed miserably. Yeah. I know for me, I, it just wasn't solidified in my brain yet. Um, so trying to get across that, well, it's not 27 telescopes. It's this many. And then you're, um, you know, doing this mathematical transformation between spatial and spatial distribution information, which isn't quite the same as an image. Um, and so you've got to be able to move between those mathematically. And what, what's really tricky is the fact that uh, telescopes aren't perfect. <laughs> I mean, this, is, this right. goes for all of data analysis. Uh, it doesn't get a perfect image of the sky. You've got to take into account all of the imperfections in your data, the things that don't match, um, the fact that it's not getting 100% of all the information ever in the universe, um, and kind of figure out uh, what the real picture is from that. I'm sorry if that got a little too detailed, but yeah, uh, no, no, no. I find it really exciting. Well, no, but I mean, I think, I mean, like I'm actually working, I'm gonna be doing an episode on interferometry and finding mm -hmm. that analogy is the is is the place you have to start and i'm trying to find mm -hmm. and i think you've given me a good piece of it which is you know people understand the double slit experiment and just this idea of how right. nutty you can go from there yeah how nutty it is the way photons will interfere with each other so it's a it's a tough one that i don't want to get it wrong so so you know another analogy to go at it i got a couple of questions here i um, think yeah oh, oh unless um, Frankie Turley. Oh, I was just going to give props to uh, I was just going to give props to Chris Carilli, who's a radio astronomer. We were standing out in, in in the field in Green Bank where we were building out our little thing, and he was the one who said, "Well, it's just a bunch of double slit experiments," and that was the moment it came right. to my head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, <laughs> so uh, uh, Frankie Turza asks, "Do you implement any gravitational lensing to assist in your observing? So, how will this gravitational Ooh. lensing?" You know, we've seen like with Hubble Space Telescope, we see like Einstein rings and things like that and f mapping out distribution of dark matter. D does that play a role in radio astronomy as well? Uh, it hasn't for me. Um, however, you can also see gravitational lensing um, with radio telescopes. So I know there's been lots of, so you can get these, um, oh God, like the Einstein rings and crosses and all of those fun things in optical telescopes. But the same thing happens to the radio light coming from the quasar or whatever is in the background behind the galaxy or galaxy cluster. Um, so you can see the effect in, in radio as well. Absolutely. That's not something that I've ever done personally, but yeah. But light is light. I mean, radio is just light's the same light. thing as, as x-rays and 
visible light. So, um, oh, and there was another question. Oh, let's talk about the moon, the, the far side of the moon as a place to put a telescope. Okay. How, yeah. how badly, how wonderful would it be to have a telescope there or not? Um, it's a cool concept. Um, this was something, so uh, Rich Bradley at the NRAO was my advisor. He is uh, not an astronomer, he's an electrical engineer. So I had like a really fascinating grad school experience learning from engineers and astronomers. Um, and I know he spent some time thinking about this problem um, because if you the reason you go to the far side of the moon is you've got this big chunk of moon between you right. and all the humans your with their wi-fi devices and cell phone is not and... gonna work there <laughs> not gonna work not, not gonna, gonna work. work yeah and if you're not even fit yeah so you're like you're like golden also um the you know that's that's one reason but the moon is really far away and difficult to build on um the other reason to go to the moon is that the uh, earth's atmosphere um, particularly something called the ionosphere. So the ionized parts of the atmosphere block the lowest um, frequency radio waves. So long wavelength. When I say long wavelength, I mean like 20 meters long. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, so if you want to view the universe in that wavelength, you're you're out of luck here on, on Earth because the atmosphere lets us breathe and live and all that fun stuff. So again, the moon, good place to go. Um, so you have to take like so, so there aren't you can't do a tw like twenty meter like very like those long wavelengths. What is sort of the maximum wavelength that you can see from here on Earth when you have to go? Then you have to go out into space to see more. But it but that think, scale um, like twenty meter like big. Yeah, I think that's the scale. So the long wavelength array in New Mexico is pushing those limits um, into how long I can, I can't remember what the what right. wavelength they go down to right now. Um, yeah, lower than that, you start to be blocked. I mean, you start to be affected by the ionosphere before that, which is what my dissertation was on. Um, but you then it, eventually it gets blocked. So you'd have to go off the earth. Well, to go off the Earth and build an interferometer, you want to know the distance between your antennas really well. It's easy to do that on the Moon, or mm -hmm. a solid surface, let's just say, rather yeah. than uh, you know a constellation of satellites. Um, so that's why the Moon has been proposed for this really long wavelength stuff. Um, but then you have to worry about, well, if there's no atmosphere, you have all these micrometeorite impacts that's going to degrade your hardware pretty quickly. So they've, they've, um, one of my favorite concepts was, so at the time I remember thinking of like a whole bunch of little wallies on the surface. I don't know why I just pictured all these little wallies building antennas because it'd be too expensive to send humans. Um, but, um, one, one concept that they talked about was like rolling out this mat with conductive material. That would be the antenna. So you don't need a dish. You don't even need a fancy, you just need a wire <laughs> I mean, right. to pick up some of this long wavelength stuff. Yeah, you can build um, a radio yeah. telescope with a with a like an antenna, like a wire, like the kind of thing that yeah. you used to yeah. get mm -hmm. your cable from. Yeah, right? absolutely. But a big one. Yeah. So uh, there's a project the called Radio Jove. I haven't actually played with it yet. It's a NASA project where you can get the kit to build an antenna, like a big long antenna, and look at uh, it's Radio Jove. You're looking at um, radio emission from Jupiter, um, and that is a it's a few hundred dollar kit. I think it's really good for classrooms. I'm I've been toying with the idea of doing one for the after school class, but I don't know if I have time. Uh, well, that's <laughs> I have the money now. I, I had, don't know if I have time. I, that's yeah. how it works. Um, I had <laughs> I had like I'd heard that idea about building a radio observatory on the far side of the moon. And that was the main explanation was, well, you know, you would be away from the just the 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 Earth's nonstop radio and growing interference yes. and even the, the satellites around it. But this idea of those very long wavelengths that you just can't observe from the Earth uh, match yeah. with a nice sort of uh, solid foundation that you would lay out the telescope. And I like that idea of of like yeah. just painting your your telescope onto the surface of the moon or is the you, surface. Yeah, yeah, painting the surface. Rolling out this mat. Yeah. And then yeah, if yeah. and if it gets, you know, chipped up a little bit by micrometeorites, it's, you know, it's not too much of a That's problem. That's the idea. How do you make it how do you make it you know, redundant yeah. enough or 
yeah, that were resistant enough to micrometeorites. That was that was one of the things they were thinking about. Now, Philip Chalebi is saying that the last space-based radio telescope was decommissioned in 2005, but I'm pretty certain there is a radio uh, astronom a radio telescope up there because I know one did contribute on the the Event Horizon telescope. So. Um, yeah, well, there was a VSOP and then a VSOP two, I think. Um, I, so I never used one of the. It's not the right one. I never used one of those um, space-based ones um, myself. I know be, being far out, you get a longer baseline, so you get finer detail in your image. Um, but again, the the problems of having it, you know, the location known exactly is even harder when something in space. Um, so I know I'd, I'd seen work done with it and it looked like super black belt type stuff. Um, there was one in space, uh, VSOP, I think was the name of it, VLBA space something something. Um, and then I thought there was a second one too. Yeah, I wasn't sure if it was used with the Event Horizon Telescope though, because I know they used Chile and Mauna Kea and Arizona. That was the other location. So, so what are the ideal targets for radio telescopes? What I mean, apart from listening for signals from aliens, um, <laughs> what is the ideal? Which I'm 100 percent for. <laughs> sure. Yeah, we can we can get to that in a second if you want. But what is the sort of the 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 best kinds of targets, you know, if you see strong radio signals out there, what are you seeing? Radio astronomy is used to look at everything from, um, so my favorite stuff were supermassive black holes and other galaxies, so extragalactic radio astronomy. There's um, the Very Large Array Sky Survey, which I'm doing some um, outreach stuff for right now. Uh, that's one of one of their targets is to to map out you know thousands upon thousands of these active supermassive black holes. Um, there's a lot of focus in our galaxy as well because you can see star forming regions and you can see um, you can see gas clouds. You can map chemicals. Um, so one of the good thing one of the things that Alma is really good for. So the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array in Chile, uh, which is at the banner. The, I use that as a banner image on on all my stuff because I got to visit it in 2013. That was super fun. Um, they uh, are working in a frequency band that they can see emission lines of all kinds of molecules throughout the galaxy. Uh, so star formation, planet formation, um, and then planetary. So then there's even things you can do in our own solar system using radio telescopes. So really it ranges from the really nearby to the really far away. What um, is the 20, yeah. is it 21 centimeters? So that's in radio, right? Yes, the 21 centimeter lines in radio. Yeah. That's what um, hydrogen, neutral hydrogen gives off. Um, it's a, an emission line. Um, so if you think of uh, a hydrogen atom is you have a proton and you have an electron, the simplest kind of hydrogen atom. Electrons going around the proton. Each particle has a has a uh, something called spin. Uh, it, we like to picture it as a little ball rotating, but that's not exactly right yeah. because quantum is weird. Yeah, yeah. it's um, not even going around. But, it's in a, you know, a distribution <laughs> probability, yeah. you know, it's not, it's, it's cloud. A yeah, <laughs> I leave the quantum, whenever I get quantum questions these days, I pass them off to my colleague, my department chair is like really good at this stuff. And I'm like, yeah. eh, eh. anyway, <laughs> um, but it, it if they're spinning the same way and then one drops and is spinning a different way to slightly different, it's a slightly lower energy configuration. So it gives off a little bit of light and the energy difference is so tiny that uh, the wavelength uh, of that light given off is 21 centimeters. So it's right. down in the radio. Um, and that's a protected band for radio astronomy. Actually, we've, we've been talking a lot about uh, human signals, humans giving off signals. Um, the, the little spot right around 21 centimeters is uh, not allowed for transmissions, commercial transmissions. Wow. Um, it's radio astronomy only, uh, which is awesome, except that, uh, as you may know, as you go look farther and farther away in, in the universe, things get red shifted. So right. the frequency shifts and then you're off into right. the rest of the radio band where we have all of our devices. Right. Uh, but, you know, it works for stuff that's nearby. But what does what does that that kind of hydrogen tell you? Like, if you can spot oh. those that distribution of hydrogen out there, what does that mean? Yeah, so that's used um, for things like mapping gas clouds in our galaxy. 
Um, so there's, uh, you can map the gas clouds as they rotate around our galaxy and actually figure out how fast the galaxy is rotating, which then leads you to the issue of, huh, it's rotating faster further out than it should be. What is going on? And maybe there's dark matter. Um, that's actually a project you can do with a slightly bigger telescope than the one I described earlier. If you had a few thousand dollars, you can build a small radio telescope, which does that. And I'm, Hoping to, that's one of the grants I'll be writing is to get money to do that right. at my college. You're going to be able to get um, your so own like, radio so telescope? Get my own little radio yeah. telescope, get my students building it and doing it. So, yes, you can do that. So, that, I mean, that work's been done, but it's it's a fairly easy thing to, rep, uh, observation to replicate. Um, you can look at the hydrogen gas in other galaxies, see how fast they're rotating, see interactions and mergers that you can't see in the optical images because... The galaxy is this big in optical light. It's maybe this big if you look at the hydrogen. The hydrogen extends further out than right. you can see the stars. So you can see how that they've interacted in these huge tails of hydrogen gas. Um, and then you can look at hydrogen from very early times in the universe's history, um, which is what these um, projects are trying to do out in South Africa and uh, Western Australia. The not SKA, but the pre-SKA projects um, that I mentioned earlier, um, looking at that hydrogen signal because hydrogen, neutral hydrogen used to fill the cosmos completely until the first stars and galaxies started turning on and giving off lots of ultraviolet light, causing hydrogen atoms to split apart. So it became ionized. Um, so the, the ionization of that hydrogen gas throughout the cosmos if you can map that happening, that tells you a lot about early stars um, and galaxies that we don't see a whole lot of with optical telescopes. Uh, yeah, and I, I don't know how, how much you're following the decadal survey, the, the next mm -hmm. round and the four big observatories that are coming down the pike for the decadal yeah. survey. Uh, spoiler alert, that's what next week's video is on. The... Yeah. Um, uh, the Origin Space Telescope, the Lynx, the Habex, and the Louvoir, and the Origins, Origins Space Telescope will be an infrared observatory that will see those first stars. So it will peer yeah. into that. Is it the Dark Ages or is it right after the Dark Ages? Um, the, it's after the Dark Ages. Yeah. So the Dark Ages is is fully neutral hydrogen. Um, those things start turning on. It transitions from the dark ages to the epic of reionization. Yeah, that's what they call it when that that hydrogen starts to get split apart. So yeah, so there's so there are radio telescopes being built now that are looking for that hydrogen signal. And that's and what you're seeing sort of limits on it across the board, right? As you're seeing, I mean, obviously yeah. with the the cosmic microwave background, they can go right past that to yeah. the you know really the farthest that you can possibly see right now until we go into yeah. gravitational waves um and then james webb even james webb isn't going to be able to reach that far it can only go back to the i think to what the ep when the first galaxies are coming together um and yeah so it's also going to probe that epic of reionization area yeah. um but when you look start looking when you open up kind of a new frontier you see the brightest things first you don't get the whole picture right away yeah so the hydrogen signal would give you an overview without having to see all the little the smaller details in terms of the smallest galaxies and things like that it's another way of studying that that epic in time yeah and it's it's I mean, that is, those are the moments that set everything in, in motion. All of the current, you know, all the seeds of how those first stars came together. How big were they? How yeah. massive? Yeah. Did they merge together quickly? Did they fly apart first? Did they gather up gas? Did they form the seeds of galaxies and then, and then accrete bigger and bigger from there? So it's, you know, that's where all those big, big questions are. And, you know, all yeah, of these absolutely. telescopes, they're all chasing that, really that, that final wall to get out there. And that's what yeah. the big monster telescopes, the next round of them is they're all trying to get out there. The within, whether it's in x-rays, yeah. whether it's in radio, whether it's in visible, all that. Um, question from Arjon, uh, can you figure out the structure of the galaxy on the other side of the galactic bulge with radio wavelengths? Mm. So is that a mm. tool to help you see the other side of the, of the galaxy? That's a good question. Um, Yes, because it can peer through the dust. So what makes it hard to see through our galaxy is the dust that blocks the um, zone of optical avoidance. light. 
zone of avoidance. Yeah. yeah. So you can use radio as well as infrared. Yeah. You can use radio and infrared um, to to map through that. So yeah, the hydrogen gas clouds, that 21 centimeter wavelength light isn't really affected by all that dust and junk in the way. So you can see that um, a lot easier. And yeah. so you can you can use that to sort of to map out potential like future star forming regions like i'm still trying to understand like that that yeah is, so is that what that gas that, is that gas is future star fuel not necessarily so it has to be really dense and cool to form new stars neutral hydrogen isn't that dense and isn't that cool so there are different um interstellar the interstellar medium the stuff in between the stars is a fascinating topic of study in a class I did not do well in in grad school but I do remember a few things so there um you know the different components of the interstellar medium are characterized by their density and temperature so it's only the dent densest coolest clouds that will are, are, are on the verge of forming stars um but the hydrogen is kind of a warmer less dense thing but it does track, uh, if not necessarily star formation, it does track, you know, the bulk of the material um, that's out there in these in these atomic clouds. Now you want to, so, so atomic clouds are less dense, you cool them down and squish them together, you tend to get molecules. Molecular clouds are the places where you're more likely to see that right. uh, star formation start to happen. Yeah. Uh, A.V. Scott and Flower wants to know, have you ever had a wow scare signal? <laughs> I, I have no, I've never had a wow signal, but I had a fun experience in grad school once uh, that I still tell my students. Um, we were at, uh, so Fan Mountain Observatory, is a, it's a meter-ish class telescope uh, that University of Virginia operates. And we were doing a project for, uh, for class. I don't remember which one it was. It probably was a star cluster. I'm really bad at optical. I don't remember. <laughs> anyway, so we're we're out there all night taking data, and I'm going. I don't know how these things work. Yeah. <laughs> I do radio. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're, so we're out on the cat. Anyway, we're out on the catwalk. Staying up at off. night is is a sucker's <laughs> game, right? <laughs> what yeah. is this? Radio no, astronomers I just, I just work in the day. <laughs> I uh, my first my first Green Bank observing trip was a 24 hour long oh. observing run. So. <laughs> We're, we're even stupider but anyway so so we're doing this project we're, we're, we're photographing these star clusters and a couple of us walk out on the catwalk because we're like wanted to just enjoy the view and look at pretty stars because even astronomers like to just look at pretty stars sometimes and we saw this bright blinking light on the horizon it looked like it was moving and it was changing colors and it was just it was super weird and it wasn't like an aircraft or anything we had seen and like and we were pretty tired to begin with, so we're like, are we seeing a UFO? Like, I'm wanting to see a UFO. Yeah, that'd be for awesome. My ex, for my, you know, days, like, being in love with, uh, you know, X-Files. And, X -Files. Yeah, yeah. 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 So uh, we're sitting there, and I'm like, and then we, we start to put it together. It's the star Spica. Like, Spica's a really, really bright, well-known star. We're all a bunch of astronomers. <laughs> and, and none of was, you knew that it was, okay. It took a good few minutes for us to figure out it was Spica. Anyway, um, because it was low on the horizon. So when you're low on the horizon, you're looking through more air. And air uh, is turbulent, and ref uh, the refractive index of the air changes, so it makes it look like it's moving, and it makes it look like it's changing colors. Um, and, and that was doing that to that star. We told, we were so tired. We thought we saw a UFO for at least two or three minutes. Yeah. Um, that, that's the, yeah, that's the closest I've ever, I've seen lots of junk in my radio data, but we don't, we don't spend a whole lot of time tracking down every junky thing we see because the vast majority of the time it's, it's a Wi-Fi signal or something like that. Yeah. I, I mean, do you yeah, have maybe. a pet, do you have a pet theory, a pet preference of what you think? something like the wow signal was um i don't know you know i i love that the more telescopes we have coming online um and, and again i'm biased towards radio telescopes the more weird stuff we're seeing um that are transient so it comes and goes right, right? um like fast radio has, bursts fast radio bursts exactly so we've the fact that we've been finding a lot of these things that change finding more of them now is really exciting so 
chances are it's one of those, you know, it, it was one of those things. If it was a real, you know, not human, not, not real, but like not human, not human made interference. Um, if it really was coming from space, then chances are it was one of those. And, and we don't know what all of these transient phenomena are. I mean, some of them are like super, super massive stars exploding, but some of them we still don't know what they are. Um, there's a big, there's a big question mark out there about these radio transients, but uh, none of them, I think, have a a signature that says that hey, it's it's aliens. As much as I want to see that yeah. happen in my life. <laughs> well, I think uh, where we at, where, you know, where we are with fast radio bursts at this point is astronomers are mm -hmm. pretty sure it's not coming from Earth. That's yes, right. Yes. They're not coming from Earth. Yeah. They're not coming from Earth. They're coming from, yes, coming from outer, yeah, it, it, there's a whole bunch of things you can do to rule out coming from Earth. The fact that we're orbiting the sun gives it a particular Doppler right. shift, uh, you know, all that stuff we can do to tell it's, yeah, it's the, not from Earth. The Australians have a telescope that is uh, far sighted, and so it can't resolve anything that's within, I forget the number, oh, okay. like within some number of astronomical units of, of Earth. And so it's That's able to detect them. And so it just, they were e immediately able to rule out that it was nice. Earth-like in, in origin. But but beyond that, people have no idea. And I've heard some, you know, yeah. really exotic explanations for, yeah. uh, for what could be causing them. But this is one of the most wonderful things is this time when astronomers just go, Mrr. Right. Let's yeah, let's yeah. let's look some more and try to figure out what this is because we don't know. Yeah. And it's a tricky one because they don't repeat. And so you just yes, find about them right. after the fact. You're like, oh, there was something that now we'll never see it again. And that's that. So you've got to catch these things fast. And that's what's been so exciting about the um, excuse me, the, the uh, gravitational wave uh, discoveries of the last year or so is the fact that they were able to detect it figure out where it was coming from in the sky and get all the other telescopes looking at it right away. Yeah, yeah. Um, Cause you got to get that, that really fast response time, which is not easy when you have these huge, you know, huge telescopes from a huge observatories, with lots of people, you know, you've got to turn it on a dime like that. It's a, it's a logistical process as well as a scientific process. Um, Grant Lanning is asking, are we as a society becoming more radio broadcast silent or do we leak Ooh. other high frequency signals into space that may someday potentially be reached by intelligent life? So I actually want to break that into just two parts. One, are we getting yeah. more or less radio silent as a species? So as a radio astronomer, I want to say no, because I know it's harder for us to deal with radio spectrum management because like, even when I was in grad school, like uh, smartphones were still just coming around. I didn't have a Fitbit, you know, like visiting Green Bank now is different than visiting Green Bank 10 years ago. I have to turn off a lot more stuff. <laughs> right. Um, I do, really do. Yeah. but, uh, but just I, like, I want to take my students there. And so yeah. everything but is giving off little, but I mean, like is the Bluetooth that you're, you know, your uh, explosive caller is giving off um, mm -hmm. different, you know, less strong than maybe the the right. television signal that you might have had before. I mean, is it sort of like that's the thing? Yeah, we're, we're we I think we have a lot of devices that are giving off radio waves very weakly, which is a giant pain in the butt for radio astronomers. But because they're so weak, they're gonna fall off much faster with distance and not be right. um, easy to pick up by an alien civilization. We are getting better at well, we're not broadcasting all of our transmissions, uh, you know. And that was the second part of this question, wait. right? Which is, yeah, yeah. you know, how how detectable are our signals to nearby stars? The you know, are they watching Hitler's? you know, announcement of the Olympic Games, or are they watching old episodes of I Love Lucy? Or or are the signals not really, like, what are the chances when you look at, say, the, was it the yeah. inverse cube law? For the, for the or same, inverse square. Inverse yeah. square, yeah, yeah, to get out that far. So Can it depends us? on, yeah, the, the, the question is, is it depends on the receiving equipment on the other end. So when we make estimates about, how far out we can see another civilization, for example, 
um, that's making an estimate about how bright their signal is and how what we know of our receivers. We have to assume, you know, do they have receivers that are as capable? Um, you can, it's it's much. You can see a directed, purposeful signal yes. much further than you could the leaked stuff. And and more recently, we're getting better at spectrum management. We're getting better at not sending things out uh, broadband. Um, we're actually getting better at, at not wasting as much energy leaking stuff out into space. So it might be that instead of an expanding sphere of signals that's leaving Earth, it could be a shell, right? Civilization, yeah. and I'm talking about general, might have a cutoff yeah. where they stop leaking radiation. And so you've got a smaller window. Yeah. <laughs> the shell is moving, right? Yeah. And if you turn on your receivers before, too long before or, or after, you're going to there was this yeah, really so that's, that's interesting a, yeah. uh, uh, man. I feel like it was like a radio lab or something that I'd listened to, and they're talking about how um, this preacher uh, had set up this transmitter in Mexico, and it was this gigantic, like thousand foot tall transmission tower, oh. and was trying to broadcast and was able to be picked up by a big chunk of like Texas and New Mexico and. Right, and it was just this arms race. And was it a preacher, or was it, or was it the the? Oh gosh, it, it was, was like a some doctor, radio but, oh, station. Doctor. Yeah, a doctor. Yeah, yeah. yeah, no, that's it. That's right. That, yeah, and it, it was, was like the, just but... this radio station, just arms race of who could set up a bigger, uh, more yeah, powerful it was transmission over the borders. tower. They yeah. didn't have. Yeah, charlatan. No, what was the yeah. guy's name? The book was called Charlatan. Okay. Yeah. And so, and so I, I like this idea. Not, yeah, I'm sure comments. someone will, we'll, we'll let <laughs> the chat, we'll let the chat handle it. But I love this idea that, John that, it's, a, that it's a shell, not a yes. sphere that's ongoing, that we are moving to this yeah. place where we have our land cables and we have our fiber optics and the need right. to transmit out on the open is not as required anymore. And that there was just this moment, this burst, where the aliens, if they were listening, yeah. could have heard us, and now it's going right. to be quiet. And then, and the same thing we're going to have as we look out into space is that maybe we're only going to see that 20 years, that 40 years that people were uh, clumsily transmitting their years, data yeah. into space, and then it all yeah. gets shut down, and then it's all private again, and, and then we're not going to be able to, to see it. So I think that's a really neat idea. Yeah. Yeah, it, it just makes it harder for us to find yep. other civilizations. It makes it a lot harder. Um, Arjun yeah. asks, uh, are there signals that you know about that you have to ignore, like data coming from New Horizons? So are there, you know, spacecraft oh. out there where if you're you're moving your radio telescope and then you get some signal and you're like, you know, oh, we found aliens. Oh, no, right, that's Hubble, right? Or that's the International yeah. Space Station. Usually, usually the area of sky you're looking at is so tiny it doesn't you, you're not gonna run across something like that however um the projects we were working on in grad school was seeing like 60 degrees of the sky at once <laughs> it's like eh. um and even though we were in green bank and even with our like most rudimentary first equipment we were putting out there um there was a, a, a satellite company called orbcom yep. it was orbcom uh that yeah that's right yeah, yeah you heard of them too um they have these I forget what they do. I think they pick up like remote data set, like data sensors on water tanks out in the middle of nowhere type of thing. But they were at 100. Anyway, the point was they were at like 136 megahertz, which is right in the middle of our pants. Right. So you'd see like, you'd see like flat, flat, flat. Bing, there's our call. Okay, flat, flat, flat. Yeah, right. because we could see so much of the sky. One of my uh, colleagues, uh, Paul Reese, uh, who he does something with satellites um did a little experiment where he was watching these satellites go through our beam and using that to calibrate the beam itself we were we were kind of using them we were freeloading a little bit using <laughs> calibration uh, uh sources uh petrozenka says once aliens can hear us then they'll signal us to shut up so that's that's the signal we'll yeah. get is the one that says shh it's not so yeah not so i'm, I'm afraid if they understand us, they're just going to, like, obliterate us. They're like, what's wrong with you? Bye. <laughs> um, yeah. So Dennis Armstrong asks, how certain are we that the Doppler shift is due to the expansion of the universe rather than the as-of-yet unknown effect due to the distance the light has traveled? I guess this is the idea of tired light. 
Um, yeah, I think we're pretty, I don't remember what the, it's been a long time since I've thought about hired light. Um, but I even just like sure that, the yeah. methods they use to confirm and double confirm the yeah. expansion of the, the universe. Right. So the expansion of the universe um, is the best explanation for a whole huge bunch of experiments. So from Doppler shift to uh, baryon acoustics to... I can't even brain right now, but <laughs> pretty much there's multiple multiple lines of evidence that that cross that connect that make that the simplest explanation that explains all of those things. Um, same thing with with dark matter. Um, the most likely explanation is it's this particle um, that we haven't discovered yet, and that's the most likely explanation that covers a wide range of phenomena that we see that other that other hypotheses don't quite cover. Yeah. Um, and I mean, the great thing is that astronomers have come up with so many standard candles at this point, be it yeah. uh, variable stars, um, uh, type 1A supernovae, supernova, uh, yeah. the, you know, the, the expansion, of, you know, the, the redshift of various galaxies, and there's a bunch more. And you can just overlap them like this really cool ladder yeah. that just builds up bit and bit and bit from from here to eternity. Um, you know, and and they all overlap. I mean, it's kind of like the same way they do, um, r like radio isotope uh, measurements to know the age of things. You know, you've got your carbon fourteen, and then you've got that as, and I don't know the other one that overlaps, but they all overlap. And over time, right. astronomers keep digging up new methods of standard candles that then they can just double check them against all the others. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. One one that I liked, and this is a bit closer in, were those um, mega masers. So masers are like lasers, but with microwaves instead of visible light. Mega masers right. are really bright ones. Yeah. Um. They uh, uh. Some of them will orbit supermassive black holes, and the the di disk geometry is such that you could get a geometric distance to a galaxy. Um, which is the way of doing it with the fewest assumptions, which we like, <laughs> um, which is really kind of help nail down that that distance ladder in, in another way. That was another thing you can use radio telescopes for seeing these those mega masers. But um, it's not just the distance ladder itself. There are different cosmological probes. So the 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 variations in the cosmic microwave background itself, um, the redshift of galaxies. Uh, the distance to the type 1a supernova, all those things will cross a certain parameter space in a different way that zero in on some answer, which is the, you know, where we think the answer is. And there's still, you know, a pretty wide range. We talk about something like dark matter, dark energy, um, all of those things. There, there could still be a wide range of variables in there, but these different methods intersect in a way yeah. um, that get us to that model. Yeah, and that, and I mean, I don't have the list in front of me, but astronomers have many, many, many of these methods from parallax mm -hmm. up close to variable stars to type 1a yeah. supernovae and, and, and on and on and on. And they're, and they're always looking for new methods because that allows them to then double check all the other ones that they, that they have. It's a, right. it's a pretty cool thing. Um, we've got about seven minutes left. So uh, hit us up with any more questions that you've got. Um, Paranor001 has taught Nightbot to say, to respond to lasers. So thank you for that. Um, uh, Paranor was asking, is your, is your energy f not being fueled by coffee? I guess. <laughs> not this late. I'm, no. I, I'm past the age where if I have coffee after like 3 p.m., yes. I will be in serious trouble. <laughs> I'm exactly the same now. Yeah. 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 If I'm a little slow, I mean, I'm not I'm that... the coffee. Yeah. Danger zone. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm technically still a millennial, like barely, but I, because I, I teach, I teach 20 year olds. I, I start to feel old in weird, weird ways. Like they don't know what contact is. They can still drink coffee at night and get a good night's sleep. <laughs> I love them dearly, but sometimes they make me feel a little bit old. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, but that feeling just keeps happening. It just gets, yeah. 
Uh, Bob Woodward wants to know, can we address the possibility of alien von Neumann probes with what the Air Force pilots saw recently? Do you want to? Oh, I don't know what they saw recently. I know what a von von Neumann probe probe (laughs) is, right? It's the, so, so it's like, uh, okay. It's like a Stargate. (laughs) No, Um, it's like little machines that uh, have some measure of, they may or may not have a measure of intelligence, um, but they... Ugh, my brain just stopped. Uh, they can build other machines. And so because it's really hard to send squishy, organic, living things in space for long periods of time to send machines. Yeah. Um, and I know Phil Plate, this is something he said. He's like, if we're going to see anything, we're going to see these like freaking robots first. Yeah. Um, but what was this recent story? I had not Oh, the Air Force has released a bunch <laughs> of <laughs> images of blips, you know, moving around on a screen. And okay. and so everyone is saying, oh, it's aliens. And uh, like, I don't know, like maybe, maybe not, right? <laughs> <laughs> Let's, uh, you know, I need to see something that is more than yeah. just a little blip on a screen. So yeah. and so if so, I'm fine to just keep it in the world of unidentified. It's unidentified. I don't know what it is. Yep. You know, yeah. flying. Yeah. If you know the Air Force is taking videos of it, then it appears to be flying, and it's an object. Maybe I'm, I'm, you know, that one I'm a little uncertain on. It could be a, a glare on the screen. It could be who knows what it is. But just because you don't know what something is, doesn't mean it's aliens, right? That's all. Aliens. Aliens. I can't. I don't have the Air Force. <laughs> I'm aliens. I, I'm not. I'm not saying <laughs> it's aliens. But it's, it's def- but it's not aliens, yeah. So that's all. Like, and that's yeah. just gonna be my answer. So if it doesn't, like Bob, you're saying they saw them with their own eyes. That's great. That's awesome that they saw this unidentified, unexplained event with their own eyes. But that still doesn't mean it's aliens. So until yeah, someone I... brings, you know, like a hydro spanner or a warp drive core <laughs> or a, you know, or some kind of alien <gasps> super fabric. Uh, then it just has to be an I don't know what it is. That's all. I think I think space geeks like us have been lo- lo- you know wanting yeah to see you know evidence of aliens for so long that we're kind of like ah, yeah. I'm not convinced yet. It is disappointing because I really really want to be yeah alien. I would love I mean, it to be aliens. I, I'm not I'm not of the the I know there are some folks who are like we should contact them because they'll take us over and maybe they will. Um, but I, I am a hundred percent looking for that. And, and I say this all the time and I, this is true for many, maybe I don't know any people in super high important intelligence positions, but the astronomers I know cannot keep their mouths shut. Yeah. (laughs) We would be worse to keeping this kind of secret. I Um, mean, this is, and this is the thing, right? Is that we, like, I have literally dedicated my life to explaining the findings that astronomers and really, it's like, is aliens yet? Mm, don't know. That, I've spent 20 years saying that exact same question. And you're exactly right. You and all professional astronomers really have dedicated their life. They've actually, like, they do the work. They learn the education. And they are trying to find the aliens. And not just like, oh, you know, it was a blip on a screen. But it, it's we have evidence that it's real. And, and that's the part that I think is, I, I don't think, like, when you've got the conspiracy theorists, we want to find aliens as much as they do, right? More. Yeah. Because <laughs> we're still skeptical. We're still waiting for really good evidence. And and it's yeah. funny to me that, that they're not allied and and they're mad yeah. when, when we're like, I can't wait. I agree with you. Let's find aliens. It would be the coolest thing that we could possibly find. But I am unconvinced. As long as they're not terrible. Which, as long as they're yeah. not terrible, yeah. Well, I mean, it would be good to Some even days, know that. I'm like, yeah, I know. I it depends on how I'm feeling about humanity at the moment. <laughs> so, yeah. Honestly, if so, dogs are better than people is my is my current thing because I love my dog. Uh, and if we were like, if we if if the aliens were like dogs, we'd be fine. But. Um, so Bob, I mean, that's all, right? This could get too silly. Yeah. So Bob, that's, that's my take on it is just like, I'm not saying it's not aliens, uh, but it's, uh, we just, I am unconvinced that it's aliens yet. So I've had this discussion with one of my students. Um, so I teach a class called life beyond earth. Um, 
it was, you know, a lot of places teach astrobiology, and this one I particularly modeled after um, astronomer Bob Rood, who is at University of Virginia. Uh, he taught this class, and I taught the summer version, and now I've taken it on to where I am. Um, so we so we talk about this in, in detail, and this was like uh, I mean, it's, it's 200 level class. It's writing intensive now, so I make them really read and write and think a lot. This is the here we can talk about big scientific questions, but I won't scare you with math because we talk about these big questions of life in the universe. But they lo they learn lots of science along the way too. Anyway, long story short, um, I was talking to my student who was taking this as an independent study last semester. She didn't have enough people for the class, and she needed to graduate. And and I said, you know, this is something I haven't looked at as closely as I did when I was younger. But I, when I was younger, we had no smartphones. <laughs> like, we didn't have cell phones. Yeah. We didn't have cam digital cameras. Yeah. Now that everyone's got a digital camera on them, the, you know, the, the, the evidence of, of flying saucers hasn't followed the way that, you know, evidence of, of bolides and meteors has, you know, yeah. oh my God, the videos we get now. Yeah. Well, um, and of the SpaceX of, of launches over L.A. Did you see all the pictures yeah, of the SpaceX yeah. going over L.A.? Yeah. And everybody, there was, a, there was thousands a of pictures. Of pictures. Everyone had a picture of it. Yeah, that's yeah. what it would so, look yeah, like. So, yeah, so she was, she, was, she was saying to me, I said, you know, what are the, what are the conspiracy theories today? Because I think her younger sibling was into this stuff. And she's like, it's definitely not UFOs because... You're right. Everyone has a smartphone that would have increased, and the, the more popular um, conspiracy theories. I forget what I think. I think the moon, the moon hoax landing is is like popular again yeah. amongst amongst high school kids. I'm like, what? Yeah. <laughs> but you know, I get that that yeah. that's something that happened for, far away in the past yeah. for some of us who were not alone. Yeah. Sadly. Yep. We've reached the end of our hour, uh, and I don't want to – All right. I, but this was super fun, and uh, I, I hope right. everyone understands why I wanted to have. Nicole uh, come and join and why Nancy suggested her. She is always a party. I'm and... so sad. I didn't get to keep up with the comments the way I used to. I'm not as good at multitasking they run and doing pretty, this anymore, They run pretty so... fast these days. So, um, Props but, to you guys. But it's okay. I yeah. was able to stay on top of it. While you were answering questions, I was looking for the, for the next one. So thank thanks, you. everyone, for joining us uh, this week. And thanks, Nancy, for recommending Nicole. If there's any other uh, folks you want to have show up here and, and answer your questions, uh, we would be, uh, I'll be glad to try and um, connect you up. Um, Nicole, where can people find out more about what you're up to uh, out there on the internets? Yeah, so I recently, um, so my website went down for like a whole semester because I wasn't paying attention. Yeah, And it happens. got infected with a whole bunch of malware, so I just killed it. Uh, but it's back because the semester's over. Uh, Noisyastronomer.com. I've got, uh, it, it's not a, it, I've changed it around so it's more of a static website. I don't really blog or write anymore. Uh, but you can get links to what I do there. I'm working on my uh, actual real college website uh, because the picture up there is terrible and I need to get a new one. Um, but yeah, so Noisy Astronomer is a good place to find me. Uh, you can find links. I'm trying to post more of what I do now work-wise because I don't, blog anymore so i'm going to be trying to do that at noisyastronomer.com but yeah awesome. i'll goof off on twitter yep. in the evening noisy you know, astronomer on twitter trouble. i think that's that's the place <laughs> you're most likely to reach nicole that's how that's i did it yes. if i need to yes. connect yes, with her it's I, true, use twitter. My, I was looking at my email like, yeah no i sent you <laughs> an invite summer, and, so I'm yeah, all over the place and then i sent you a tweet and i'm like okay yeah that's how you get it that's how you yeah. get her attention so all right nicole. not during the semester but during the summer yes. yeah all right. Well, Nicole, thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, thanks, everyone, for thank watching, you, and we'll see you next week. Thank you, Nancy. <laughs>